Hey, and uh, welcome to the third lecture on um, quantum computing in Learn Masters with uh, Dr. Mark Mattingly Scott. So, um, Mark, this is the lecture where we try to make it applied. So, let's say I'm a, I'm a manager, I'm a leader, I'm a board member, I'm an investor in one of the industries you've mentioned, and I decide, okay, I want to figure out what to do with uh, this uh, quantum computing. The only thing I've figured out so far is that I should quickly figure out how to invest in uh, quantum brilliance. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I missed out on Google at the IPO. And I remember us sitting, you know, in a corridor and laughing, saying that, you know, $150 a, a, a share, you know, it's just madness. And uh, I, wish, um, I wish I knew then what I know now. So perhaps I can avoid it with quantum. But um, <laughs> you mentioned you mentioned uh, three areas of applications, and I'll try to summarize it in my kind of simple language. So the first one was this um, simulation application in the real world. So you said anything material, chemicals, pharma, oil, energy, life science, agriculture, where you need to figure out how would things develop if you push them this way or that way could have a great advantage using quantum. Then the second group was, you call them linear algebra problems. And these are solvable based on these um, ideal qubits, which are still kind of difficult to, to, to make. Um, and this is the machine learning AI sort of group of problems, mm -hmm. which are in every industry really. Mm -hmm. And then the third one was this area of real qubits, which um, I don't even remember exactly the difference between the two, but these have a bigger tolerance for failure or statistic uh, uh, imperfections, if I understood you correctly. And this is where finance is already scratching their head on how to gain an advantage on the others. Have I summarized it more or less? More or less, yeah, pretty good, pretty good. <laughs> you, don't, you, you don't need my help. <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> you, 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 you can't imagine how shaky uh, a foundation this is based on. Okay. So if Sylvia is going to bluff one step further on quantum computing, how does she get started? Where do I go and, you know, start scratching some more? So um, I guess there are, there are two or three things you, uh, you need to do. First of all, you need to read. Um, because you need to you need to lay the foundation of of learning um, what qubits are and how to actually use them. Um, there is um, there is actually a it's a large but still finite number of scientific papers and books on the quantum computing out there. I've totally lost track, and I was keeping track of every book on quantum computing and quantum mechanics. Um, my bookshelves, you can see them behind me. The, this isn't the quantum mechanical section that's over there, um, but literally hundreds of textbooks on and around but, but this subject. Mark, with all due respect, uh, dear Mark, um, you, you are <laughs> a nerd. <laughs> and I'm not sure how long uh, we uh, normals would last in one of those hundreds of books. I mean, there is still not a Netflix documentary, I guess, on, on quantum computing. So... But you have a TED wait, talk. Wait, wait, wait. I have a TED talk um, where I attempt to explain um, how qubits and quantum computers work. And for viewers and listeners, if you just Google uh, my name and TEDx Stuttgart, uh, you should pick that TED talk up um, where um, I use an, an analogy between a spinning ball and a spinning coin to explain how qubits work. Um, there, um, there is a lot of information out there, uh, in addition to my talk, um, literally hundreds of, um, YouTube videos explaining from the very basics to very advanced hardware related, um, concepts. Um, IBM is, uh, is at the forefront in that educational push, but there are others as well. I mean, it's. It's then more a case of uh, how do you curate and recommend the best videos and the best source of information. 
It also depends on your language. Um, so you know, in German, there are some really good German language explanations of how it all works. Um, there is uh, introductory papers, white papers, um, um, blogging, blogging activities. One person who's really, really good on the blogging side is Scott Aronson. Um, and for you, Sylvia, is a, somebody who understands uh, computational complexity. Scott Aronson's blog would be uh, something you should definitely take a look at. So I think in terms of raw information, um, it's where do you, you know, where, where do you position yourself on that uh, wave of information, um, you know, f collapsing over you? Um, in terms of uh, YouTube and other sources, um, there's a lot of information out there. If you actually then want to take the next step and start to use qubits at the moment as a just a generally an interested person, the uh, only effective way to do that is through IBM, through their um, quantum experience cloud offering. Um, that may change, or that's almost certain to change in the future because I can't imagine that IBM's competitors will sit around on the, and twiddle their thumbs. But um, there's also you know, that, that's a way to actually use real quantum computers. Um, there are also a number of num number, a number of um, quantum computer simulators out there, which are also accessible either via the cloud or you can download them from GitHub and at least for a couple of qubits, run them on your PC. So there are a lot of opportunities to actually interact with real and simulated quantum computers. Um, in order to get to but, the but point... But how do we do that? So we need to... Is there a programming language? Is there... Um... Sorry. <laughs> um, so, yes. Typically, you'll be accessing quantum computer today via a cloud service. And a cloud service is... Uh, the, the, the technical term is through a service endpoint. Uh, what that means is there is a TCP address to an, an internet address with a port. And if, as long as you send a, an, actually an HTTP request to that port with your API call encoded in the right way, that, there's a little, there's a server on that port and it'll listen and say, ah, okay, I've got to do something now. And it'll decode what you're sending it. And then it'll do that, wait for the result and then send it back to you. So a service invocation via the cloud. Um, and there's all sorts of, you know, there are APIs to enable you to inv to use that using particular programming languages, typically Python, but also other languages. So Q Sharp from from Microsoft, Brockett from uh, from uh, Amazon. Um, there are many different languages, and and essentially the languages are uh, determined by the developers and the people you want to have using. The quantum computer. For the quantum computer itself, it doesn't care what language you're using to program it. Um, it's it's going to be doing operations at the hardware level, much the same as if you're using a tip uh, a computer. You know, my there's a there's a processor here in my Apple Watch. Um, it's programmed using uh, um, I forget the name. It's, it's a variation of C, uh, which Apple developed. My laptop is also working my other laptops running windows they're all using different programming environments the hardware doesn't actually care and it's the same with quantum computers the hardware doesn't actually care so you've got your your qubits you're accessing them you've learned about them you've watched some youtube videos um you've read hopefully read one or two books um and um you've um, probably reached the point where your brains are fried um, sooner or later, um, everybody gets there. Um, and then you've also found a way to actually start playing with a real quantum computer. Um, and now you're faced with um, a challenge. And the challenge is, how do I get my head around how to program, how to usefully program a quantum computer? And I, I'm, all I can do here is relate a personal anecdote which maybe may help people so this is 
me personally, something I did very, very, very many years ago. Uh, I did a PhD in information theory in 1985. Um, and I developed a method to, um, to generate what are called spread spectrum code sets. You don't need to know what those are. They used in uh, they used in nowadays used in five G, um, and I developed an algorithm. And then about two years ago, when I really started to get my teeth into uh, the programming side of quantum computing, I went through an exercise of trying to rewrite my PhD algorithm, a PhD thesis, using a quantum computer. And by doing that, I learned uh, a lot about programming quantum algorithms and what the difference is. And I think one of the core takeaways for me was that, and this comes back to what we talked about in the last session, um, the way we solve problems today is in a very strong sense determined by the limitations of technology we're using to solve those problems. So the way we write computer programs is, is designed to be efficient to run on a computer. When you move to a quantum computer, some things become much, much more efficient and other things become less efficient. So you basically need to throw all the assumptions about what order things happen in out of the window. And that was the a key insight for me was that actually in the classical algorithm, I did things in the order A, B, C, because that was the most efficient way to do it. When I translated my algorithm into the quantum realm, um, I actually ended up with CBA because that was more efficient. If you look at P Peter Shaw and his factoring algorithm, he went through that same process. He determined that, that actually there was a more efficient way to do things, a more efficient order to do things, which got you to the result faster. So in terms of how do you move from just being able to use a quantum computer, understand what a qubit is, to actually creating your own unique thing with a quantum computer, there is a big, there's a step in there. My own personal history and challenge with that, the probably the most useful thing I did was read the history of uh, and details of how people like Peter Shaw, um, Lev Grover, all the other people who developed some of the fundamental algorithms we now know about, how they actually did that, what their thought processes were. And Peter Shaw has, I think there's a video up on YouTube where he explains exactly how he got to his algorithm. That has to be compulsory viewing for everybody if you want to get to the point where you're actually using quantum or actually able to use quantum computers to write new algorithms. Um, I think it's an incredibly interesting um, and a bigger point than just quantum computing. And it is how, you know, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so we have the classical computers today, and we are solving, as you say, all problems around us with the understood restrictions and constraints of those hammers that we have. And it is, um, it is an, a very difficult retraining of your mind to <laughs> understand the new kind of a shotgun that you have suddenly and what it will do. And, um, I, I just think the people that understand the real advantage that, that this will give you, um, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a bigger strategic challenge than a technical challenge is, I guess, what I'm, what I'm trying to say. No, I think the, the people who understand that fundamental principle, that, um, that problem solving today is constrained by the exact details of the technology that's available today um, and not the other way around, um, which is a mistake a lot of people make. We think, oh, we can solve problems, so let's just take the latest, greatest computer and we can solve them. If you get to the pointy end of business or the pointy end of science and technology, you very quickly realize that actually it's the other way around. Um, we're constrained by the technology and not enabled by it. If you then take it, bring our technology into play, which is fundamentally different and fundamentally capable of drastically accelerating certain things, then 
the real challenge and the people who are really going to benefit both in a societal and business context are the ones who suspend that, who, who are conscious of that, the way things work now and say, okay, I need to reframe in the sense of what are the new limitations? Not what are the new capabilities, but what are the new limitations? Um, how can I reframe? How can I re-express problems? How can I re-implement solutions using this new technology? Um, and therefore, you know, achieve drastic uh, speed up in certain classes of problems. And part of those are in terms of the fundamental technology itself. And part of that is in the terms of how do I access it, which is why I come back to what happens if you have a, if you have a quantum computer which is autonomous or you don't need connectivity. What does that mean? Uh, what kind of problems will you be able to solve? To be honest, I have absolutely no idea. I can't tell you today. I have an inkling of some problems, but what's the full scope going to be? No idea. Ask me in 1989 to 1996. That's seven years. Ask me in seven years. That's when we will be. That's the difference between HTML and e-commerce with seven years. It'll be, okay. I think with, with quantum, it's going to be a bit quicker. I noted 2028. Yes. Uh, I, uh, we, uh, I, have to, I have to digress, Mark. Uh, talking with you is so fun, and we always end up, you know, um, in, in a couple of universes um, away. And by the way, my, one of the images in my head when you started explaining this whole ideal qubit, etc., cetera, was um, Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and the Great Answer of 42, but us yes. not knowing uh, the question. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> So um, <laughs> I, I, I want to get a little bit philosophical here. Um, it is a matter of innovation. So just uh, a couple of days ago, I was in a board meeting where somebody was actually exasperated with this obsession with innovation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're saying we are paying too much heed and too much uh, um, respect to innovation. And to me, that sentence... Uh, contrasted with what you're telling me today is just, you know, I, I can't parse it even. It's like if we don't care about innovation and we close our eyes to the opportunities you're talking about, then we are just in a sunset mode. And, and, and then I want to ask you, you know, in, in current times, I see this obsession with us putting in young people, new heads as guarantees of innovation in many jobs. So now by my calcu calculations, you're about 60, I'm about 50. And both of us are obsessing with understanding something. So you're 61, you said. No, I was born in 61. I'm, I'm rapidly, the date 13th of September, I am rapidly approaching 60. It's, it's not many weeks away. Okay, we'll celebrate. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, I, I, I'm I'm just thinking, so first of all, youth is no guarantist of innovation, age is no guarantist of experience. So how do we make sure that people independent of their age have enough combination of experience, curiosity, and and you know, just this hunger to figure out what's next, to actually be able to use something as disruptive as this? What what, what are your thoughts on innovation and and, and maybe society? Um Hmm. So um, uh, the analogy I'm going to use is with biology. In biology, uh, stagnation is death. Biological systems which don't adapt, which don't uh, change, uh, die off. Because the environment, uh, the universe is always um, changing and uh, requirements and environments are always demanding adaption. And innovation in a technological sense for me is just a particular way of expressing that same principle. Um, technologies change, the capabilities of technologies change. Ignoring those is just not an option. Um, you will stagnate, um, you will regress, um, and you will become more or less, um, I wouldn't say superfluous, that's too strong a word, or maybe it's not. Um, but um, your ability to 
your ability to embrace, capture, and um, cope with the resulting change in society in, in, in the business world, in the economy, will then be severely limited. And if you're not, if you're not in front of innovation, then um, you're probably going to be consigned to the history books. Um, that's the risk. Um, I can understand sometimes, or I sort of understand why people are, um, are tired of innovation because it is exhausting. Um, but that, that's in a sense, um, if I look at my own life, um, uh, starting a family, having kids, having a career, juggling all the balls and, and, you know, that, that involves, um, there is no, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. Um, you have to get up every morning and say, okay, just, you know, dust your shoulders off and say, right, ready to fight. Um, that's in a technological sense, in a societal sense, acknowledging that, that imperative, I think is very important. Um, what I'm not saying is, you know, the, the survival of the, uh, the strongest and the fittest and everyone else is uh, irrelevant. Absolutely not. Because I think on a personal level, one of the key measures of a civilized society is um, its ability and commitment to um, embracing the needs of those who are disadvantaged or are unable to uh, to cope um, for whatever reason. I think the reason is irrelevant. So it's you know how do we um, how do we help and support the disadvantaged? In whatever form, that's a measure of a civilized society. So I think the the challenge then is how do you do both? How do you embrace innovation, uh, and how do you stay civilized while doing that? That's something that, and I'm I know you're going to smile at this. Um, I think that's something that in Europe we can, with a few exceptions, demonstrably do, which maybe other societies, other places on the planet, are not quite as good at doing. We're very good at that. I have to, I have to uh, throw in two balls here. So you, <laughs> we always end up talking about books. And uh, I'm listening at the moment to um, a book by uh, Farid Zakaria, 10 uh, Lessons for a Post-Pandemic World. And mm -hmm. uh, he's brilliant. It's, it's really, really, really nice. And he has this observation uh, about lots of, he, uh, you know, I'm, I'm never, I promise culturally to myself, I'm never going be to become a pure vegetarian. But the way that he, for example, argues for vegetarianism almost made me so. But uh, um, he talks about modern humans being actually a man-made invention. And I think the difference, you know, that I see to your biological argument, where you have time to adopt, you have generations to adopt, and it's the speed of change of evolution and nature that that fits with this kind of adaptive darwinism it, it is it is on exponential timing now in 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 modern human culture and it's how do we get there fast enough um without you know overheating absolutely everything and basically getting the whole world out of the spin um and before this book i was reading um a book by uh, scott galloway it's called The Algebra of Happiness. And I was fascinated ah, by... Uh... I have it. It's over there. Ah, so I love him. I love his writing. And yet I'm thinking he's a perfect adaptation to um, society that I think is wrong. <laughs> it is so competitive and so out of what you're just saying now, where, you know, yes, the best ones can win. And you have to compete to be those few best ones. But, you know, we can't have a society where everybody is best and we need to stabilize it somehow. And so I'm getting back to your last argument now. So the, um, just as an, an aside and maybe a, an interesting source of information, the idea of secular cycles. And I've, if, I won't distract by going and looking, but I have a pile of books here and the book is in there somewhere. Um, the idea of long-term historical processes, which are invariant, and have shown to be been shown to be invariant across human history. 
secular cycles, it's called, um, is also very relevant in this in this context. Um, what does it say? Or it what? Says, well, don't quote me because uh, I, yeah, I probably approximately, remember. Yeah. Approximately, what it says is that there are um, supra generational processes which human societies go through. Super generational means over many tens of years. Um, and this is not a different uh, cycle, they believe? These cycles typically take, I think, around 200 years. Um, they can be they can be pretty clearly demonstrated going back at least to uh, uh, at least a, a millennia. Um, and they basically revolve around the idea of elites and uh, surplus and uh, what's the opposite of surplus? I've forgotten. Um, I know in German. Um, Deficit. Deficits or and surpluses and the, 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 the establishment of elite, so an elite group. Um, <clears throat> so the establishment of, uh, of an elite and then the collapse of an elite. And this particular cycle, so, you know, of, of population growth, these cycles repeat themselves throughout human history. Um, and there's a very, very interesting, the guy who wrote this, and I've forgotten his name, apologies to him. Um, he's written a book about, um, about modern America. Uh, and it's really, really actually quite frightening um, that America is on the cusp of... Uh, <laughs> going down so the rise and fall of you know the, the the rise and fall of the british empire the rise and fall of the roman empire um these are all examples of secular cycles they're not the only ones so that's one one point i think the um you know the darwinistic survival of the fittest um taken to ex extreme is uh of course very antisocial. um you you come from and live in a society which is uh, quite social. I've come from a, a country which was somehow in between, and I live in a country which is also quite social, where the idea of not letting the underprivileged or the disadvantaged or those who have absolutely you know, no reason uh, are, are unable to fend for themselves or for cope for, to cope with for themselves, you do not let those people drop into... Uh, a horrible existence or you at least try to to avoid that i think that's um uh, there is a phrase that my father used to say to me um he'd say always remark always remember when you see somebody on the on the street who's uh, begging um or you see somebody who's got nothing um there's a phrase in english called there but for the grace of god go i and i always have that in my mind that um it's um, taking care of people who are disadvantaged, and an an internal ethical standpoint is key, both for the individual and for the society you live in. Um, and there are a lot. Unfortunately, there are lots of places on Earth where that doesn't seem to play a role, um, but but not here. Mark, uh, we again strayed a little bit from uh, practical tools and uh, and tactics for applying quantum um, uh, computing in our um, work, but um, I think it's really interesting to to have a touch of um, social um, reflection when you reach a technology as disruptive as the one we are talking about now. But what I get from from our conversation related to tools here is that we need to read, we need to um, perhaps watch YouTube videos and this, your TED talk will look up and follow Scott Aronson. And then those of us who have programmed a little bit uh, might try to play with uh, these uh, simulators and, um, and, and most importantly, try to rethink the way that we slice our current problems and solutions in new ways. Yes. Uh, very succinctly put. <laughs> you, so, did what, you did what you did what I'm incapable of doing, which is explaining it clearly. No, you are um, <laughs> you're extremely interesting, uh, and uh, I don't think I dare to touch this topic with many other people, um, Scott. So, with that, we're going to end our third lecture, and we're going to meet uh, for a very brief fourth lecture where we're going to try to apply some of this. I'm not sure that's uh, practically possible, but we can we can do a thought experiment. Okay. Thank you Thank so you. much.